وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين. اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم. إن الذين آمنوا والذين هاجروا وجاهدوا في سبيل الله أولئك يرجون رحمة الله. والله غفور رحيم يسألونك عن الخمر والميسر قل فيهما اسم كبير ومنافع للناس واسمهما أكبر من نفعهما ويسألونك ماذا ينفقون قل العافو كذلك يبين الله لكم الآيات لعلكم تتفكرون في الدنيا والآخرة ويسألونك عن اليتامى قل إصلاح لهم خير وإن تخالطوهم فإخوانكم والله يعلم المفسد من المصلح ولو شاء الله لأعنتكم إن الله عزيز حكيم ولا تنكح المشركات حتى يوم ولا أمة مؤمنة خير من مشركة ولو أعجبتكم ولا تنكح المشركين حتى يؤمنوا ولعبد مؤمن خير من مشرك ولو أعجبكم أولئك يدعون إلى النار والله يدعو إلى الجنة والمغفرة بإذنه ويبين آياته للناس لعلهم يتذكرون صدق الله مرانا عزيزا Brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. We started with verse number 219 last week, but we did not uh, go beyond half the verse, and I'm going to repeat it today, inshallah. It says, Yes'alunaka anil khamri wal maisir. They're asking you about khamr, and they're asking you about maisir. Khamr was the name given to the alcoholic drink in Arab. They used to make one type of drink, alcoholic drink, they called it khamr. Now, uh, commonly it was made from dates or grapes, one of the two, dates or grapes. And it was so common that there was hardly anybody who would not drink. Everybody used to drink. There were a few people who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saved them from the beginning, they did not drink. Some people, very few, very few, not a lot. So, do they, one of these people, one day Jibreel alayhi salam came to the Prophet sallallahu and he said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent me to tell you that uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala likes Hazrat uh, Jafar Tayyar. You know, Jafar was the son of Abu Talib. He was the cousin brother of Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Jafar. He likes Jafar because Jafar has four qualities in him. Those four qualities Allah likes. Allah wanted me to tell you that. He likes Jafar for four qualities which he has. Good qualities he has. Allah likes him for that. He didn't tell him what these qualities were. After a little while, Prophet called ja, this, the Jafar and he asked him, told him, what are the four qualities you have that Allah likes so much? He said, I have never told anybody. But now that Allah has informed you already, I will tell you. And he told him, you know what I, before you became a prophet, even before then, he said, I used to see people have the drink, and when they have two or three drinks, they get, they lose their respect, and they don't talk properly. So I thought drinking is no good. So I said, I will not touch it. So I didn't drink at all. Number one. 
He said, second thing is, when I go to this Kaaba and other places, and there are these statues, and people are worshipping the statues, it always occurred to me, how can this statue made of uh, stone or wood, which we have done ourselves, how can that be any good? How can that? It just was telling me in my own mind, I, I didn't really believe in them. So I quietly, without telling my father, I just stopped going and going before the statue. And even if I was forced to go by him, by my father or anybody else, I would go, but inside I would not, I, I don't ask anything from them. How about can they do? This was my second point. My third quality was that I have got sisters and I have my mother. And I am a very uh, proud person. And I would never imagine anybody doing bad relationship with my sister or my mother or my daughter. So I said to myself, if I don't want my daughter or my sister to have any bad relations with my how can I have bad relations with somebody's sister or somebody's daughter? Because any woman I will have a bad relationship with, she will be somebody's sister or somebody's daughter or somebody's mother. Therefore I gave up. And that was again one of those things which was very common in the Arab market. It was not considered uh, wrong in the sense it was not shameful. They would sit down and talk about it very freely. I had this, I had that, I such and such girl, I had that woman. This was common. But he said, no, I kept away from it. That's three. And the fourth he said, when somebody lies, to keep up that lie, he has to turn ten lies afterwards. So I thought to myself, why lie at all? So I stopped lying. I used to lie before I started. So these are the four qualities. I don't drink. I don't worship idols. I don't have illicit relations with any woman. And I don't tell any lies. These are the four qualities. And Allah liked them so much. Allah sent to me to tell the Prophet to tell him that Jafar Tayyar has these four qualities. I like him for those four qualities. So the Kamb, which was consumed by almost everybody in Mecca, there were some who on their own, before it became haram, on their own, they had, they said, we don't want it. And then, as I told you last time, this stoppage, this thing came in four stages. Then we have a lesson to learn from that, a big lesson to learn from that. And that is we are sometimes very, very strict with people who enter into Islam, <coughs> new Muslims, or even Muslims who are Muslims. You know, Muslims in the sense they are born Muslims. We're very strict with them. And we shouldn't be. We shouldn't be. Look at when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants them don't drink. He doesn't just say, hey, don't drink from tomorrow morning, from now, stop drinking. He gave for years. It took several years before he finally said, stop it. Keep away from it. Finally he said, and Allah knew he had got to say that. It's not that Allah was experimenting on the Allah yet, and Allah knows. But he did it in that way. And when Maaz bin Jamal was sent as the governor to Yemen, he called him and he said, Maaz, remember these people, when you go there, they are non-Muslims. So when you talk to them, don't give them the whole lot of things, do this, do that, do that. Just tell them, la ilaha Explain to them and tell them that's what it is. And he was going as the governor, so he was not going to be tortured by them. He said, yes, I'll do that. He said, when you feel that they are comfortable with La ilaha illallah, tell them Muhammad Rasulullah. And when you feel they are comfortable with that also, then ask them to do Salat. And then ask them to do Zakat, step by step, step by step, pass them to do Whereas we have, I have seen this, that's what I am saying in Baltimore. In Baltimore I saw that a lady who has born a Christian, and <laughs> brought up as a Christian, and then she suddenly uh, liked Islam, something about Islam, and she started reading and she became a Muslim. Alhamdulillah. Now it's not more than a month or so she has become a Muslim, or maybe one and a half months, whatever. And she was asked to get out of the masjid. She was asked to, she was turned away from the masjid. She felt so bad because she doesn't have, she's not covering the head. You don't have proper hijab. You don't know how to put hijab. 
imagine she has come here to Islam and Wallahi, when I see somebody who has accepted Islam, some non-Muslim, I always ask myself one question. Would you, if you were born in a Hindu house, and there are not many Christians in where I come from, Kashmir, but there are Hindus. If you were born in a Hindu house, you know, Hindus worship idols and monkeys and whatever. If you were born in a Hindu house and you were brought up as a Hindu boy, would you have one day said, this is all wrong, I want to look for a new religion? And would I have done? The answer comes from the inside, honestly, no. I would have gone. So it's a great thing if somebody is changes and comes out of one religion, comes into Islam, it's a great sacrifice. Besides that, I have always been told from my childhood, don't eat pork. Eating pork is bad. Pork is bad. I have been told that from my childhood. God forbid if I did change my religion and became a Christian and you offered me pork to eat. Would I be, would I relish it, would I eat it with all the pleasure? I wouldn't. I wouldn't want to eat it. Maybe I will because now that I have changed my religion to show that I can. So similarly, whenever anybody changes the religion comes to Islam, there are certain things in Islam which they hated before. Now they are going to do it. So be kind. This is very important. No. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about the khamr and then four stages. As I told you last time, the first stage was in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala simply said that I have got grapes and dates. Some people make a drink out of it. Some people make rizqan hasana, good food. This is a good drink and good food. <coughs> and some people make a drink out of it. Some people make good food out of it. That gave a clue to people who well, Allah didn't use the word hasana with the drink. So far as making a drink is not a good idea. There are some who said, we are good. We're not good. They didn't do it. And then after some time, next one verse that came, that came, he said, uh, there is in this uh, drinking, there are some advantages, but the sin in it is greater than its advantage than the benefits. You know, it became clear that you still can, you can still drink it. It's not haram. But the sin is greater than the advantage. So a lot of people gave that. Then came another one. Oh, those who believe, don't pray. Don't go near the prayer when you are drunk. If you are in a state of drunkenness, till you know what you are saying. Otherwise you might say something wrong. That was another thing that people then said, wow, how do you drink, when do you drink, what's the time? So they stopped, a lot of them. And so the ground was prepared. And finally, talk. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, no more. No more. Stop. Another thing that we have to understand, this is I'm just giving an introduction to you. Another thing that we have to understand is that 13 years our Prophet sallallahu alayhi spent in Mecca. Two-thirds of the Qur'an came down in Mecca. One-third of the Qur'an came down in Medina. Two-thirds came down in Mecca. And for these 13 years in Mecca, we were told, Muslims were told, for 13 years in Mecca, Muslims were told that you do not fight back. Why? What was, what was, what was the I mean, idea? What was happening? What was happening is this. There was no difference really between a Muslim and a non-Muslim in Mecca. They both wearing the same clothes. They both having the same appearance. Nothing was told that you do this, you do that, well, all that come. And those 13 years were spent, two-thirds of the Quran was spent only to correct their aqidah, to give them tawheed, to give them la ilaha illa. This is very interesting how Islam developed. To give them la ilaha illallah, Allah gave, and 13 years, Allah did not tell them you must have song, you must you must fast. Allah did not tell them you must have zakat. Allah did not give them the rules of nikah. Allah did not give them the rules of talaq. Allah did not give them the rules of distribution of property. All the rules, nothing, nothing was given. Just one thing that was given is concept that there's only one God concept that you are answerable to God on the Day of Judgment, that you will be going to 
be standing before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of the Akhir. Only this concept was The result of that was what? The result of that was that these people really became in their aqidah, they became really hard. They became really so strong in their beliefs. So that now they are ready. And when they went to Medina, all the uh, akam, all the laws and regulations were given to them. All rules and regulations were given to them. And they were ready to take something like a farmer. If he has to sow maize or rice in the field, he spends a lot of time in preparing the ground. And his yield depends on how you prepare the ground. Well, I think his yield depends on how you prepare the ground. If he was lazy in preparing the ground, just takes the rice or takes the maize and just spreads like that and says, now, what is he going to do? But he spends time in preparing the ground. He prepared the ground and then sowed the seed. If we are in America and we are in a great minority, such a small minority, what, and we want to invite others to Islam, we want to remove the Islamophobia from them, what <coughs> should we do? Prepare the ground. Have our mm -hmm. character. Prepare our character. Not just start first day giving them rules and regulations. This is it, this is it, this is it, this is it. Prepare the ground. Once you prepare the ground, you're ready. Whatever you sow, it will come. And that's what happened. When they came to Medina, then the account came one after another, one after another, one after another. This, 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 this. I think they accepted it. Nobody questioned it. And this is coming in Medina, this one. The other one, the others were coming in Makkah. This one is coming. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, concerning the wine they are asking you, and they are asking you, they pull, tell them, Fihima ismun kabir, there is in the sin in that is big. And there is some advantage, there is some uh, good in, for the people. Ismuhuma akbar min nafihima, but their sin is much greater than the benefit you derive out of My sin is a word which means uh, distribution. Distribution. And Yasir is the one who distributes. This was one of the ways in which uh, the Meccans used to, all Arabs used to play gamble. I think I told you last time what they would do is some people would get together and then put the money together and go and buy a camel. After they have bought the camel, let's say eight people have put the money together and bought a camel. And this camel they will do zawa and then they will make portions. many portions. portions. They'll make portions. And they will give the tickets to people. People will draw the tickets. They will draw the tickets. And the number of the ticket they will take that portion. And there'll be some, maybe one or more, who will not get anything. They will have number six and there is no number six. Or they will have number three and there is no number three. So these people have lost. There will be two or three or one, depending on how many people are participating in it. These two people get nothing. And they pay the price of the camel. That's their loss. Those who get nothing pay the price of the camel. The meat they will not take home. This is one important thing. The meat they will not take home. The meat they will give to the poor. They will distribute. That is why, because they will give the meat to the poor, they said, you know, this is a wonderful thing. We are doing a good job. We are distributing the meat among the poor. So that was, that was therefore, the gambling was respectful. And it was respectful. You know, people, people respected it. It was a good thing to do. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that no, it's not. Yes. So, but then there was no sense of drawing the last thing, and you know, they were distributing people who are they were just distributing. And why to draw those numbers? Who will pay for it? I mean, they will still pay for it. No, who will pay for it? Yes, you see, the whole idea of gambling is this. You are the gambling, you are not paying for it. You are not paying for it. Some of the meat you can take it yourself also. But even if you don't take, you are not paying for it. People are paying for it. Who is going to pay for it? That's the kick of it. 
Ah, he had the best. He lost. That's what happens in gambling today also. That's what happens in gambling. Somebody loses and the person who is winning, he gets a kick out of it. Ah, he lost hundred thousand. But in this case, nobody is winning. They just have to give it to the poor people. So it's just a... Uh -huh. so, no, no, no. It's not like that. There's no point in winning. You don't win just for the purpose of uh, taking home. To, to give to the poor people. After you won it, you give to the poor people. That's fine. That's what they like. That's why they took the pride. They took the to the poor people. It's now mine, now I'm giving to the poor people. So this is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, then they're asking you next one, Yasalunuka Maza Yun They ask you what should we spend on? How much and what should we spend on? Tell them spend as much as you don't need. What you don't need, don't hold. What you don't need, to spend. Spend that. And of course you will know what to spend on and what not to spend on. There's a hadith in which Prophet said on the Day of Judgment, nobody will pass, get past the day in the Day of Judgment till he is asked four things. One of the things is, whatever mass, mass means property, money, or all this material, whatever mass, how you got it and what you spent it on. It's good if you ask that. So, you just spend only, uh, spend, earn only so much as you need, and the rest you spend. Allah says, Kazalika, you buy. Okay, another thing is, our Prophet Wasallam, he said, he said that as far as money is concerned, do not be greedy. Do not, do not try always to earn more and more. Whatever work you are doing, whatever your profession is, whatever your profession, work only as much as is needed. According to your own needs. How much you need to work, work only that. Way. To satisfy the needs of your family, your needs, whatever, according to the standards you are living in. Needs in America are different to the needs in Bangladesh, different from the needs in Nigeria. So you work according to that, except, he said, in two professions. In those two professions you work as much as you possibly can work. One is the doctor's profession, <laughs> and the other one is justice. Because with that you are helping the people. But if the doctor is working only for getting money, God help him. <laughs> he should be happy near that I'm helping the people. Okay. So, I wonder that. So, anyhow, yes, afu. Kadalika ayat. This is how Allah makes things clear to you. Uh, so that you will start thinking. Fit dunya wal akhirah. Yes, sir. Work in another profession, and you have both harder, you have surplus. You can do good with that surplus. Of course you can. Yeah. Yes, of course you can. So what is your niya is no. If your niya is that I want to earn more money so that I can give away more money, nothing like it. You do it then. Then it's okay. But when you earn money for dunya, to earn money, money to 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 get more money for yourself, that's why Prophet Sallallahu said you don't need to because you get more involved in dunya. It's better that you get less involved in dunya and you think of Akhir. So what is the guidance? What is the need? Spend time in, in God's uh, yes. choice. What, what is the guidance? What would satisfy my need? Oh, but that's Somebody again, that's, a, that's, that's the there again, there again, this is different. Individual is different. Your needs are different to my needs. So what is the general guidance? General is nothing. It's your needs are different to my needs. You have to ask your heart, ask yourself. Right? Nature, you need a car, you need a car, what kind of a car you need? There are cars available for 15,000, there are cars available for 150,000. Which car you want? Which car is necessary for you? So you ask yourself, I can decide that for you. But remember that whatever you decide, keep in mind that I have to uh, produce evidence for the decision on the day of Remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that's taqwa. Remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not I can argue with my father or with my son or with my wife, no. 
you know, cannot argue on the day of judgment. On the day of judgment, you can't argue. Remember that you have to answer on the day of judgment. So, depending on how much you can, what you want to do, how much you, you can. I, it's all depending on individual person. You cannot say that. You cannot say so much is enough for you. I think the answer to your question may be that you live within your means. That's right. You live within your means. You don't outspend yourself. You live within the means of what you can afford. I mean, look, yeah, you asked for a general guideline, that would be the general guideline. But I've also heard, if this is correct, yes. if Allah has blessed you with money, then there's no harm in spending it on yourself either. You shouldn't try and hold it or be yeah. with it. Yes. So if you can afford a hundred thousand dollar car, then you should. There's no sin in buying Spend on yourself, but spend on what? <laughs> spend on yourself, but spend on what? Let me give you an example. As person came and gave a gave a present to our Prophet Sallallahu was Hadiyah. And what was it? It was a kind of a shawl, which in those days only aristocrats used to wear. Very costly. And that was a sign of kind of arrogance. If you're wearing that kind of shawl, look at him. And he will also show off the public. So the Sahaba said, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam never going to use it. He's never going to accept this gift from him. And he always accepted gifts. He didn't say no to gifts. So he took it, he said, thank you, he accepted the gift. So the Prophet of the Sahaba said, he's not going to wear it. Next day, to their surprise, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came out with that shawl. And they wrote, oh my goodness. But he wore it for an hour or two, whatever time, and then took it and called Ali and said, take this shawl, sell it in the market. He's supposed to get a lot of money. They said, yes, sell it and give the money for sale. He did wear it, not haram to wear it, he did wear it, but only for a short period of time because he accepted the gift, used it. I don't want such a shawl. I, I, I'll have to stitch his own clothes, which were torn. So that's, that teaches us, you know, that if you want $150,000 car, if I gave you a present, $150,000 car, by all means take it, use it, but you can use it. $20,000 car just as efficiently. Why do you want to use that? That's only to show off or only to be arrogant. That's not right. But philosophically, Islam is not against capitalism. It's not a socialist type of uh, philosophy. It allows you to earn as much as you want to. Of course, it allows you to earn as much as you want. But you see, you, you have to keep dunya in your hands. And akhra on your head. If you have a crown on your head and your hands are carrying something and the crown gets displaced, what do you do? You leave this and correct this. Alright? I have, I'm carrying something in my hand and something on my head. If that thing on my head gets dislodged, disturbed, I put this down and correct this. And if you are dunya and akhra, if your akhra is going wrong, drop your dunya. Look at your akhra, mm -hmm. immediately. But if you are going to keep akhra on your hands and dunya here, <laughs> so that if anything goes wrong with the dunya, never mind the akhra. Never mind the religion at that time because it's going to hurt me, so it's all right. It's all right. Some different point. I, I guess a simple explanation might be that there's no harm in wealth, but being attached Yes, of course. Again, yeah. also me. depends, you know, what you are, yeah. what you are accumulating the wealth for, or, or making the wealth for. You can spend them in the right way. You know, that's, that's the best way you can do. It's going to help you and the community. I think there's no harm in uh, making more money or earning more, as long as you, you, you satisfy this principle, which is one of the high ups of the that you, you keep what you need and give away the rest. So you can earn ten million dollars a year, and you you keep whatever you keep keep and give away the nine million dollars or nine and a half million dollars. That's good. Okay, that that's fine. Yeah. But you, you can't justify that you you want to live in a five million dollar home or drive a hundred thousand dollar car. That's no one needs that kind of home. No one needs that kind of car. Right. Then that makes a difference. Those kind of cars and those kind of houses. 
wealth for the nation by employment. Certain people employed who manufacture those cars, who build those houses, you are contributing to their salaries. So are you contributing to the salaries of the people who run casinos? Yes, right. And you are also contributing to the salaries of those people who run pubs. That's if you so don't. if I say boycott pubs and boycott casinos, in the same thing somebody would say, hey, you are depriving people who are working in casinos and pubs. Yeah, but those are haram by nature. Well, A this car is, is not haram by nature. No, car, car is not haram, but you see, the question is simply this. Islam is something where, as I said, you, you have to ask your heart this question. You have to ask your heart this question. Why are you using that very big house? Why are you using that very big car? Why? What's the purpose of that? What is the purpose of that? And as doctor said just now, this is important. The earning money is no harm at all. You can earn as much as you want. We have in, we have in uh, example, our, our, in our thing, we have the examples from in our in, in our uh, religion. The Sahaba were very rich. Some of them were very, very rich. Very rich. Osman Ghani was very rich. Prophet Sallallahu gave him his daughter in marriage. She died and gave him another daughter in marriage. She died and said, Wallahi, if I had another daughter, I would have given her to you also in marriage. He likes him so much. And he was a very rich guy. He didn't say, I don't like rich guys. No, he, he likes him. But how did he spend his wealth? Read his history. Read his life. And see how he spent his wealth. There's uh, one Abdul Qadir Jilani, you might have heard the name of Abdul Qadir Jilani, was a wali. Abdul Qadir Jilani. Pardon? Yes, he was a wali. And he was giving a, a sermon, and somebody came and told him, you know, uh, sir, um, that you are all your wealth, you know, you, your goods that you had sent in that ship, that ship sank, and you lost all your money. When he heard that, he stopped and he stopped, stopped for some time, then he says, Alhamdulillah, and continued. Alhamdulillah, and continued. A few days later, again, he is giving the same, same uh, congregation, and somebody came and said, Sir, good news. He said, what? He said, that was wrong news. Actually, that was another ship that sank. You have actually got your this thing and then they have taken that to wherever it had gone. You have earned double the profit. Your profit has doubled. That's the news that has come. Oh, okay. He did the same thing. Alhamdulillah, and continue. When he finished, somebody asked him a question. You heard everything is lost. And you said, Alhamdulillah. You heard everything is gained. You said, Alhamdulillah. What is it? He said, when I heard everything is lost, I asked my heart, are you upset you have lost all the wealth? The heart told me, no, I'm not upset. Lost all the wealth, Allah gave it, Allah took it. Alhamdulillah, my heart is in good, good shape. And when I heard that you got so much wealth, I asked my heart, hey, are you excited now? Overwhelmed now, excited? My heart said, no, Allah is the giver, Allah is the taker. I said, Alhamdulillah. So actually, a good Muslim earns spends and you know you you can be a, you, you don't have to earn a lot of money five million or ten million you can be a, earning a little money and be a miser you can be earning a little money and make your family suffer not because you don't have you have but don't give them so it is actually this is correct what you said live within your means whatever you have and ask yourself do i need this how much do i need and how much do i not need and the other thing to keep in mind is that at your wealth, that you are the trustee of the wealth that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you. It has come from Him. Yeah. It has come from whatever intelligence He is giving you to acquire that wealth comes from Him. You're the benefactor of the wealth. Some, some people are a larger beneficiary than others. That's it's what you have to keep in mind. Yeah, I give, I, give sometimes, I give sometimes this example that I'm wearing my shirt, I'm wearing my trousers, I have some money, I put $500 in my shirt pocket, I put $700 in this pocket, I put $1,000 in this pocket. And these pockets are talking to each other. This pocket says, the left pocket says, I'm rich, you guys are poor, I got $1,000, you only have 500 
Then she won. And the other one said, ah, make, and then I go to the shop, pull out from this thousand, eight hundred, give it to the shopkeeper, and two hundred remain in that pocket. That pocket should have realized from the beginning, it's not my money. It's his money. He can pull it out any time he loves. Pull it down. Huma malik al mulk. To til mulk man tasha wa tanzu al mulk min man tasha. Allah says, I give whom I like, I take from whom I like. So that's why you are a custodian of this. Custodian. You are a custodian of this. Think about it. That this is all belong to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. I'm a custodian. Let me use it right. Next verse, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says. Now they are asking you about the orphans. He is asking, telling Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. They are asking you about the orphans. Kul islahun lahum khair. The best thing to do is what is for their good. For the orphans, do what is for their good. When to call it to whom for ikhwanu. But if you mix them, mix them with your family. Then that is good for them. Now that teaches us a very good lesson. Nowadays the ten- tendency, the trend is what? That two things. One is that let's adopt this child. This child has no parents or something. We we'll adopt the child. And we know that Islam does not allow adoption. Islam says adoption is wrong. Second thing we do is let's get these orphans together, and we make it an orphanage. Now there's an orphanage, and everybody says oh, there's, an orphan, there's an orphanage here. Orphans are there. Last time when I visited Kashmir, I, say, I was told that there's an orphanage here, orphanage there, orphanage there, and there's one place where they have this, these children. I went there to see them. I was surprised. The children look very healthy, well fed, and in the garden outside there were two or three sheep grazing. So I asked the person who keeps that. I said, "These sheep, whose are these sheep?" He says, "They're ours." I said, "Why you keep it?" He says, "Yeah, people come and give us, so we cut a sheep and eat them. The children have a good time. Anybody has anything to do, they send it to orphanage. They send send this money to orphanage, and you get a mentality: these children, they are orphan children. Mm-hmm. They are orphans. We are orphans. They are not normal children. We are orphans. They live together. It's not healthy." It's not healthy. Somebody is desperate to talk to me. I cannot at this time talk to you. This is. Uh, I want to come. Uh, 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 sick talk, you know. So this is not. This is not a healthy. Thing. If we, but then we are told Muslims, non-Muslims say, you Muslims, you don't care about the uh, orphans because you say we cannot adopt them. To spend on orphans, cannot spend your money in a better way than to spend on orphans, because everywhere, everywhere in the Quran, you are told to spend on orphans. Spend on orphans, spend on orphans. Spending money is different from adopting. When we adopt somebody, what happens? There's an adoption agency. We go to the agency. We say, "I'm going to adopt the child." The child, I've taken the child. Some usually we take a child very small, very young, maybe. Few days or few months older, maybe a year older, whatever. So we take this child, and then when we have taken this child, we the child lives in our house, and he takes my name, and my daughters are his sisters, and my brother is his brother, my wife is his mother, right? That's how he is told. That's what he thinks. That. He thinks that, and I think that, and everybody thinks that. Neighbors think that, and we are supposed to think that. He grows up. He becomes an 18-year, 20-year-old son. Let's say it's a boy. Then my daughter is another daughter is 18 years, another daughter is 16 years. He is their brother. Gives them an embrace. Holds holds the hands. Lives together. Can he do that? He's not biologically they are related to them. This is against Islam. What about my wife? She he cannot be the son of my wife. He cannot be son of my wife. He cannot be. So this is totally wrong. Second thing is, when I die, the property is distributed. He gets a share of the property. 
does he not? He inherits what belongs to somebody else. How can he inherit what belongs to somebody else? <coughs> That's again wrong. Thirdly, the person to whom this child was belonging, not necessarily Yatim, maybe the father is still alive. Or if the father is not alive, then it's the duty of the uncle. Islam has given that. If your father is not, who is going to look after? That person who is supposed to be looking after this child is completely absorbed of all the responsibility. So all around it is wrong. And how we know that adoption is not allowed in Islam is, you all perhaps know this, but you remember that there was Zayd, Zayd bin Khan. He was from a very good family, I think in Yemen or somewhere, from a very good family. And he was captured by people, that's what they used to do in those days. And then he was sold to somebody. And then somebody sold him to somebody else, and then somebody sold him to the cousin of Khadija, where they lost along. So he's the slave boy, slave boy of Khadija, uh, Khadija's cousin. And then when Khadija got married to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, they got married. The, the, uh, the, this cousin came and gave this as a gift to Khadija. Here you are, as a gift. He was more or less same age as our Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Was 25, and Zaid was about 26 at that time. They were same age. And our Prophet was Rahmatullahi our Prophet would not treat a slave as a slave. So he, so he developed some kind of an affection for him. When Khadija saw that, she said, you like him, don't you? He said, yes. He said, she, she said I, I gift him to you. Go, oh, he's yours. So he was given to him. Now he's Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, slave, living in. Parents came to know. Somebody told them, your son is there in Mecca with a man called Muhammad bin Abdullah. And so they took some <coughs> money, good money, and the father and the <coughs> uncle of Zaid came all the way and traced him. And when they found him, they called, called him and they told him, I'm your father, this is your uncle. We have come to relieve you, we'll buy you back from you. And you come home. So they will jump now, you know. Slavery is gone. So he said, no, I don't want it. They said, you are silly, you don't understand. Get your master. Let's talk to your master. <coughs> so they called Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He came from the master. He said, I'm the father. He is the uncle. We have found him after so many years. We want to take him. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, I have no objection. He wants to go. I don't need any money from him. If he wants to go, he can go. You are father, you are uncle, you want to go. He started crying. He said, Ya Rasulullah Sallallahu don't leave me. He wasn't there. Uh, so at that time, Ya Muhammad, don't leave me. And he said, I don't want to leave you. And he told the father and uncle, I don't want to leave this man. I want to live with him. I don't want to leave him. No matter what. Then Prophet said, if he doesn't want to go, I won't let you force him. He's grown up. He doesn't want to go. Then leave him alone. And when they saw that he is so happy, they also left happily and then Prophet took him at that time and went to Kaaba. That's why they used to go for anything. And he made an announcement. He said, Zaid is free. I have freed him. He's no more slave. Not only that, I have adopted him as my son. He didn't have a son. Prophet didn't have a son. He said, I'm adopting him as my son. Khalas. He came to be known as Zaid bin Muhammad. Zaid bin Muhammad. Zaid bin Muhammad. He was his son. He came to be known as Zaid bin Muhammad. Then Prophet had a cousin, Zainab. She, he got uh, Zaid married to Zainab. And after some time, Zainab did not accept Zaid. She was, she was thinking, I'm Quraysh, I'm this, I'm that, this slave, you know, she was slave until yesterday. And anyway, they didn't get on well. Prophet Sallallahu tried a lot to get them together, but they did not.